Hi folks, uh, I just want to talk to you about the problem, the fundamental underlying problem of malware um, and closely related problem of software vulnerabilities and why after all these years we still have issues with malware. We've got decades of software engineering, operating system development, software development, all these things of um, you know we've done a lot over the years and yet we still have a fundamental problem with malware and that problem is that programs don't always act in the best interest of the users that are running them. So however the end users often are forced to trust that software is acting as it's intended to. We do not have the time in our lives to read through and order all of the software that we run. Most users don't have the ability to do that anyway. Uh, but there's a massive amount of software that runs on your computer and essentially you have to trust that it's acting in your best interest. So this fundamental problem there. And when we've got malware, that's malicious software, and the author intends for that program to do something a bit naughty, uh, to misuse the um, privileges on that computer. When it runs, it does something bad. Malicious software is software where the authors have made a mistake. So the programmers, you know, have fairly good intentions, but they fail to deliver. So they make a, either a design problem or a programming problem, like an implementation bug. Um, and the result is that attackers can exploit the software. And the end result in either case is that you have software running on your computer that someone else has the ability to uh, make that software be malicious in nature and do something that you don't want it to do. Um, I think that this quote is quite a um, insightful, gives you some insight into what Microsoft were thinking when they designed Windows. So this quote is it's quite old now, but it's from an old TechNet essay called The Ten Immutable Laws of Security. And one of those laws is, quote, if a bad guy can persuade you to run his program on your computer, it's not your computer anymore. Let that sink in. So Microsoft is saying that if you someone else writes some code, then they it's not your computer anymore. They get to control what happens on your computer. That's kind of terrifying, right? Um, so if an attacker wants to do some malicious things and there's a malicious program running with all of your user privileges, and that attacker basically has the power to use those privileges to do whatever they want. They just need some way of getting the malware onto your computer and then they can do that. So that's the case on traditional desktop systems like Linux, Mac or Windows. Uh, and it's starting to shift away from that now. So if you install a Linux app via Snap or if you use uh, Android or Windows modern apps and things. So we're starting to see some sandboxing. But the problem is still that the programs are running with a lot of privileges that they don't actually need and they can misuse those privileges. So you, in, in that case, you have to think about where you're getting your software from and can you actually trust your software? Who can you trust? Uh, which authors can you trust? I do trust that Microsoft and Adobe aren't going to intentionally put malware on my computer, but Adobe in particular have shown a t terrible track record in terms of the security of their software having vulnerabilities in their software. Um, and then if you're getting your software from repositories, do you trust where they're getting their software from? And how do you know that where you're getting your software from are even who they claim to be? And that's where digital signatures and certificates come in to basically let you know that they are who they say they are. It still doesn't tell you whether you can trust them, but it a certificate will tell you if they are who they say they are, unless there's a problem with the certificate. Um, provider, for example, 
as has happened in the past with VeriSign, who um, gave away a Microsoft certificate. Who knows who, but someone had a Microsoft code signing certificate for many years. So there are restrictions and things in place that can restrict the authority that each program has on your computer. But even the under traditional models, even just running as a user, gives that program a massive amount of privilege. So if you run a program and you, you manage to remember not to let it run as an administrator and doesn't run as root, it just runs as you, well, that could still be accessing all of your web browser history, any cached passwords that you have in your web browser, for example. Uh, and so, you know, this can be bad. So in conclusion, what I've talked about is essentially an identity problem and that a lot of software has this problem of ambient authority. So the programs that are running on your computer are actually running with more privileges than they technically need to do what they're supposed to do. And then with malware, that means that you've got software that's doing all sorts of malicious things. And with software vulnerabilities, you've got a program that is um, basically with a vulnerability, you've got software that with a programmer makes a mistake. But the end result is that an attacker can make that program misbehave. So there's something to think about and, and it emphasizes the importance of making sure that we don't accidentally run software that we don't trust. And when we do run it, we need to be thinking in more modern ways about how we can really restrict programs to only act with the privileges that they actually need.